We're very happy to have Jim White here with us. The Suxdorfia board wanted to have a good spring program. We kicked our brains around. We said, what about something about trees? And right away, I thought of Jim, my good old friend from astronomy days. Uh, we approached him. He, he, he gladly said, Les, yes. And I'll let him take it from here. And he'll tell you about why he's such a good person on the subject. Take our way, Jim. Okay, well, thank you, Don, and uh, welcome, everyone. I hope everyone's uh, tolerating the weather well. Uh, again, my name is Jim White. I'm, I'm a forester. One more point I guess I should make, Jim, is this is being recorded, and it will be available, but the recording won't be available until probably late tomorrow. And for that, you go to WNPS.org, and that's where you can check into it there. Um that will be available not until late tomorrow. I'll repeat that again at the end of the program. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, well, I uh, that's okay, Don. That's an important one. Again, my name is Jim White. Uh, I live in Trout Lake, and I, I understand that we, we may have people from all over the state. So uh, uh, Trout Lake, if you know, is just south of Mount Adams, uh, north of the Columbia River Gorge. I'm a forester. I had a career with the U.S. Forest Service and uh, managing the local conservation district. And I still uh, work for them just a little bit in forestry and I uh, keep my fingers in uh, a few other things. So I worked a little bit as an ecologist too. I also have a degree in wildlife biology. So I got kind of a, a lot going on. What I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen and, and bring up a PowerPoint, which is basically what I'm gonna be dealing with. So you're not gonna need to look at me much longer. And let's see if we can get this up here right. Uh, and get that out of my way. My little box in my way here. I can't. There we go. Slideshow. Beginning. Whoops. Okay. Uh, you can everyone now see my uh, my screen. Looks good, Jim. Okay, well, uh, once again, my name is Jim White and welcome to you all. Uh, and uh, Don asked me to talk about, uh, about trees and I thought, well, I'll talk about our native conifers. And I'm gonna focus on identification. After all, this is a native plant group and I'm sure you guys are uh, used to uh, trying to identify what you're looking at. So what I'm going to go through is uh, how to identify some of those. And uh, when Don, uh, uh, asked me to do this was just oh, a month or two ago and uh, you know you always need more pictures and this is not the time of year to get out in the woods and get pictures with snow and winter and so uh, I looked around and uh, I found a website called nwconifers.com a fellow named Ken Denniston and he was graceful enough he said sure you can use my images on your site and he's got quite a collection so I've got a lot of images from him and I wanted to tip the hat to him and I also have some from an outfit called forestryimages.org and then some that I took myself. Now what I'm going to cover is identification. You know, it's important to know what you're looking at. You can, uh, you can talk about the woods, but it's really valuable and helpful to uh, know what species you're looking at and how to identify them. Just the same as uh, other plants that you, uh, Native Plant Society folks may be dealing with. I'll talk a little bit about some ecological characteristics of each, like whether they're shade tolerant or not, and some other characteristics like economic, wildlife value, and maybe a few things of special interest. Also, where they occur on our landscapes, that's important. And uh, so, you, as you'll see, I'll be going, uh, doing it in a way where I walk across the landscape. And save your questions for Ian. Unfortunately, with 75 or 80 people, it's pretty difficult to uh, uh, ask questions in the interim. I almost hate to do that because sometimes it's hard to remember those questions at the end, but uh, put them in the chat box and we'll get to them when we're done. And uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not time constrained, so I'll be happy to talk to someone or chat afterwards. It's probably yeah, better, we, Jim, if they put them in the Q&A box down oh, there. Q&A, okay. Sounds, down at the bottom good, of your man. screen, you see Q&A. Click on that and it'll give you a chance to type in your questions. Well, here's the species I'm going to cover. We, we have a lot of coniferous species in our woods. You know, when you drive up down the I-5 corridor or uh, 
maybe up the gorge, you see a lot of Douglas fir, but there's a lot of other species on the landscape too. They don't all occur in the same place, which is something I'll be covering, but uh, we've got a rich, uh, rich variety of, of conifers in our forests. Uh, there's a bunch of, I'm not going to cover too. Uh, these, uh, many of these are located in Oregon further south of here. Uh, Sitka spruce I'm not covering because that's over on the coast. Okay. And I don't have the junipers, which are of course uh, a bit east of here. So uh, I could spend all night talking about even just conifers. And I'm not talking about hardwoods like our wonderful Oregon white oak and uh, a few things like that. But uh, anyway, uh, that, that first list I've got is what we're going to cover. And I'm going to do it in kind of a, a virtual trip from east to west. And uh, this little diagram you're seeing is from a, an ecology guide that the uh, Gifford Pinchot National Forest put out. I used to work for them in one of the, one of the ecology guides. And it's kind of like a diagram from going up the gorge from Portland to the Dalles. And also it kind of shows the elevations of, of the mountains. Okay. You could flip that around and have Mount Hood in the background and it'd be pretty similar on the Oregon side, of course. And I think we all know that we've got a, you know, we got in our part of the world, we got these tremendous gradients. You know, we go from a, a pretty wet area in Portland, Oregon, and in what, 70 or 80 miles in the Dalles, you run out of trees. Uh, tremendous moisture gradient going from west to east. Uh, and also as you go up in elevation, you get a temperature gradient too. So uh, moisture and temperature, two things that really drive uh, our, uh, our plant communities and drive the occurrence of our tree species. Just so people know, some of you may be familiar with this, but uh, one thing that really drives that is something called orographic lifting. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that little triangle in the middle, think of that as the Cascade Mountains, uh, my, my simplified drawing of the Cascades. But our mountain ranges pretty much runs north and south, and our prevailing winds run west to east mostly. So, uh, and what happens in our neck of the woods is, is those winds come in, they hit the mountains, and they have to rise. And of course, at higher elevations, you have less air pressure. And if you remember your high school physics, when the, uh, a gas under less pressure uh, expands and cools. And so that, that air cools, drops some of its moisture. This time of the year at higher elevations, it, it's snow. And then when it goes around to the east side of the mountain, it's already lost some moisture. So it's a little drier. And then as it drops back down in elevation, it compresses, warms up. Warm air can hold more air. So it, the relative humidity drops and it dries out. So we get this gradient from warm to wet to cool wet, cool dry, and warm dry as we go from west to east uh, in the in our neck of the woods. And uh, it's you know it's it's different than many parts of the country don't have anywhere near the gradients we have because of uh, our mountains and our proximity to the ocean. I'm going to start. We're going to do this. Uh, sort of like taking a little trip. I'm going to start in the low elevation forests west of the Cascades and we're going to we're all going to take a hike. We're going to hike up into the into the snow and then down on the east side and uh, cover species in that manner. And when we start out down in these lower west side forests, the three major species we have, Douglas fir, western hemlock, and western red cedar. Well our first one is Douglas fir. One of our most important conifers, and I, I'm guessing just about everybody knows what a Douglas fir looks like. They, uh, they are so common. Uh, if you don't want uh, a really good key is uh, the, the cones of Douglas fir. That one, as you can see in that picture in the upper uh, center, uh, they have little bracts. Some people call them pitchforks that stick out from the uh, cone scales. Some people think they look like uh, a little mouse that's uh, tunneled in there with his rear legs and his tail sticking out. Anyway, those, those little pitchfork bracts are fairly distinctive. And uh, cones persist on, on the tree also, so you can usually find them or find them on the ground underneath. A good way to identify Douglas fir is its cones. Its buds are kind of uh, good to try too. They're, they're conical and they're very pointed, like the picture in the bottom center. Uh, I'll differentiate that from some of the true fir uh, uh, buds later on, which are more blunt. But uh, pointed uh, uh, conical buds. Needles come out on all sides of the twig and the bark, the bark's a tough one folks, uh, it's, uh, but uh, it's furrowed, uh, deeply furrowed in the older trees. Smaller trees is kind of smooth. When it gets real old, as the lower picture in the right shows, uh, it gets so thick the furrows are so deep you can grab hold of it and people talk about you can shake hands with, uh, with, with Douglas fir bark. 
Douglas fir has a widespread occurrence, as you can see from the map, something called an ecological amplitude. It just grows in a lot of different places. Here it grows on, not only in the west side where we're looking, you'll see that it's on the east side also, grows into the Rockies all the way down into uh, Arizona and the like. It's shade intolerant. Douglas fir needs light to, uh, to get started. So uh, uh, Douglas fir forest, if you'll notice when you walk through, you don't see very many Douglas fir seedlings on the ground because they, they need uh, a fair amount of light uh, to get started. So uh, shade intolerant, an important concept. The tree is very long-lived. Uh, uh, it can grow very large, uh, 14 feet in diameter, 300 feet tall. Uh, that's, of course, the extreme, but uh, very large, very long-lived tree. I'll have, I'll have a little bit more about how long live it is in a second here. It's got high ecological and commercial value. We all know that Douglas fir wood for structures uh, is, is very important and very good, and uh, the, it's just it's so common. Uh, that it has high ecologic value also. Uh, not only the tree, the epiphytes that grow on it, the uh, uh, snags, wildlife that use the snags and the live trees for perches, even when it's on the ground, uh, a, a, a down log in any species, uh, but particularly in Douglas fir, very high uh, ecologic value. And it's a state tree of Oregon. So you folks are from Oregon, you can celebrate that. Here's a Douglas fir that uh, I got a little slice of one that was it was uh, a, a snag in a campground on the Gifford Pinchot. They had to cut it down because it was uh, a hazard tree in the campground in 2010. And uh, the fellow that uh, a friend of mine sliced up a couple of pieces and he gave me one. And uh, so I've got this little piece of uh, uh, slice of a Douglas fir that's almost 600 years old. And uh, if, you, if you look a Good, take a good look at it. And I can't see this because of my own picture being in the way. Oh, there we go. There's in 2010, there's about what it, uh, about the time we, I uh, think it died or at least it was cut. Well, there's where it was in World War II. That tree is, was growing very, very slowly, but growing. In fact, there's where it was in the Civil War. So as you can see, that tree had an awful lot of growth even by the time of our Civil War. And even at the Declaration of Independence, back when we started as a country, that was a fairly good sized tree. And it was even not too small of a tree when, when uh, Columbus landed in the West Indies. So this tree, uh, I like doing this because it says a little more than just saying how old it is. You realize these things can outlive many things. It's, uh, they're, they're truly a part of history. And I think about it to you, back to the ecological value, think of this tree, of course, this is a pretty big one. That's been here for 600 years. That snag, had it not needed to be cut, probably would have stood for maybe another 20. And a down log could have lasted another century. These things can have a tremendous value just in the long time that they're there. Our next species is Western hemlock. Uh, and hemlocks are pretty easy because they have this characteristic droopy tip. Uh, mountain hemlock, which we'll cover a little later, also has that, but the tip doesn't stand up straight. It kind of sags over to the side. Uh, the needles on western hemlock are short and they're kind of two rank, which means they're kind of two rows on either side of the uh, uh, branch, like you see in this little twig in the middle. Uh, and they're unequal lengths, and uh, that apparently that's where the name heterophylla came from. So that's kind of a neat little thing, I thought. It's got thin bark. It's not fire resistant has lots of cones. They're very small, maybe an, only an inch in diameter or so. Uh, there'll be many, many of them on the tree and on the ground underneath. It produces a tremendous amount of seeds. So uh, western hemlock. Western hemlock is very tolerant of shade. So in these west side forests, this may be the tree you'll see growing in underneath those Douglas firs. Uh, it can survive at a slow growth rate for a, a long time. And when there's a little opening, it can take off and uh, grow. And when we see older forests, we often see them as a combination of Douglas fir and Western hemlock. They didn't necessarily call come in at the same time, but uh, uh, the forest can uh, develop that structure over time with a, with a shade tolerant tree that comes in. Uh, the wood is valuable for structural boards. And it's good for pulp. It can grow to be a very large tree also. Very valuable to Native Americans. Uh, or these are for herbal tea from the leaves, pitch from additional uses. And that's just a taste. My guess is if we uh, 
had a Native American speaker that they probably could talk about every one of these species as having value. And Western hemlock is a state tree of Washington. I hope you all knew that, at least all you Washingtonians, but that's our state tree. The third one we have here is Western red cedar, Thuya placata, a cedar with tiny scale like leaves and flat sprays. Uh, it's got a stringy, fibrous bark, uh, wonderful aroma. I think probably many of you know what a, what a Western red cedar looks like and smells like. It can be, that can be a very large tree, can be very tall and very large in diameter. In fact, the, sometimes the trunk will flute out at the base. It kind of spreads out and uh, they can be just en enormous trees. Uh, cones are small and brown and kind of woody. Um, this tree is shade tolerant. It does like moist forest sites and it, it does grow on the east side too, even though I have it over here on the lower elevation west side part of the, the talk, uh, more so on, on moist areas. Uh, it's got a valuable wood. It's very decay resistant, used for shakes and siding, and very important to Native Americans. They used it for everything, shelter, clothing, baskets, dugout canoes, you name it. Uh, the photo here was, uh, I got this from Rick McClure, who's a, a local archaeologist and historian. And uh, this, this may be uh, in other parts of the state too, but out here you can find trees that where they uh, the bark was chopped off, stripped off to make, usually to make baskets. And quite often when Native Americans were moving up into the, into the woods in the summer to pick berries, they would stop and peel off some of this to make some baskets along the way to, for berry picking. Uh, it's been valuable to archaeologists because when they find these things, number one, they know that this is a route that they used. And number two, they can age those scars and see about when it happens. So Kind of a kind of a neat thing with uh, Western red cedar that, uh, that we see around here. Now we're going to move up in elevation a little bit in the Cascades. Think of it now we're getting up into the where maybe snow persists a little longer, although I think right now snow persists everywhere, right? Uh, we still have Douglas fir and Western hemlock and Western red cedar, but we're picking up a few higher elevation species. It's now a little bit colder up here. Pacific silver fir, Western white pine. And noble fir. Pacific silver fir. This is the first of the true firs, the species Abies, that we'll run across. Now, Douglas fir, as many of you probably know, is not a true, it's not an Abies, it's kind of an animal of its own. Uh, but the, the uh, genus Abies are noted for they have cones that stand up on the branch. And we'll see that with the uh, with the others. Uh, they have the, the needles are dull green above, and on the lower side, they have two white bands, which are stomata. And stomata, uh, a stomate is a little opening in, in leaf that for gaseous exchange of, uh, of materials for the plant. Uh, and uh, Pacific silver fir, you can tell by the needles, if you have one that's uh, where they're dull green on the top and they grow out all around the stem and two whitish silvery rows of stomata on the bottom, you have Pacific silver fir. The cones, like I said, with all the genus ABC, stand up right on the branches, and they're not—they're—they're they're hard to use for identification because they don't—they don't persist. The cones in true firs, uh, they dry out in in late summer, and they just kind of fall apart and they spread the seed, and you don't find them on the ground or persisting on the tree like you do with many of our other conifers. Uh, once in a while, you'll find one on the ground when squirrels cut them, and you'll find this big gooey, pitchy uh, cone down there, but you—you uh, you don't find them a lot. Uh, the bark is thin, grayish, it's smooth when it's young, hence the name silver fir, and has some, uh, a, a little more character when it gets a little older. Silver fir is very shade tolerant. It somewhat replaces western hemlock at higher elevations. Hemlocks, western hemlock starts to drop out in numbers, and you get more Pacific silver fir. It has thin bark and shallow roots. This one is not, not fire uh, resistant at all. It can grow to be a very large tree, 150 feet tall, uh, three, four feet in diameter, and, and it can be very long-lived. As you can see from the map, this one doesn't grow into the Rockies. It pretty much stays over here on the, on the west coast where it's uh, colder and, and a little wetter. Pacific silver fir. Noble fir, this is the second one of the genus Abies that we talk about. Now this one has, the needles have two rows of stomata on each side. 
and it gives the tree kind of a bluish appearance. And maybe you can see from this, uh, uh, the picture of the branches here, uh, uh, that it, it's, it's kind of blue green, it's a beautiful tree. Uh, something I always find too, is that the, uh, the branches have a very regular appearance. There'll be one uh, uh, stem sticking out and two at the side, like, like chicken's feet, very regular, whereas silver fir and some of the others have more of a random appearance. And uh, that's one that it, it can be difficult, but that's, that's what I use to uh, identify it. The inner bark is kind of reddish. If you cut into it, it has medium deep furrows. And the cones, once again, if you can find them, they're purplish and they have a kind of a papery bract. And this uh, picture kind of shows it. They're very different looking than the, uh, uh, than the other AB species uh, cones. Something that does help, it reminds me too, I sometimes, if you're looking at trees, a good thing to have is a pair of binoculars because if you can't find, for example, uh, cones on the ground, sometimes you can spot them up in the tree and with a pair of binoculars, you can, you can get a look at things that way. Noble fir is shade intolerant. It needs open areas to get established. Unlike silver fir, silver fir is shade tolerant. It can grow in its own shade, not noble fir. Noble fir needs an opening. It can be very tall and very large. Uh, uh, Jerry Franklin, some of you may know who he is. He's a professor at the University of Washington in forest ecology. I remember him talking about a noble fir stand near Mount St. Helens, and he thought it may have a more volume per acre, not the biggest trees, but more volume than any stand he'd ever seen. But at least it's a tremendous amount of wood. It's, uh, it's a beautiful tree. Noble fir grows slowly at first, and then it sort of catches up with other species. And that slow early growth is probably an ad adaptation for growing in deep snowpacks. This thing's up in the mountains where you get a, a fair amount of snow. Uh, it grows in the open, so uh, if it grows too fast, sometimes those trees can get just broken off and twisted around by the deep snow. So noble fir kind of takes its time, gets itself nice and stout uh, when it's young, when it's still sitting within that snowpack, and then uh, grows faster when it gets a little older. It's a very popular Christmas tree, as many of you may know, and uh, uh, that, that's why the beautiful blue color, uh, and it's got very stout branches, uh, very good for holding ornaments and the like. Very popular Christmas tree. The blue tint, remember I said noble fir has kind of a blue tint foliage. Well, that, you can even see that from a distance. And I hope some of you can see this. I've got a little arrow. Uh, I'm not sure how well this comes through over, uh, over our connection, but those noble fir you can see on the hillside are kind of bluish green, uh, unlike the kind of reddish green uh, or yellowish green of the other trees. Uh, and hopefully you can see that. And uh, remember I said it comes in in the openings. Well, here's, a, here's that same area back in about 90 years ago. As you can see, that was part of a large burn. So those noble fir, they were able to get started in that open area where it had, uh, could get uh, sunlight. And uh, we have a pretty nice little stand of noble fir there where, uh, where that fire was. This is up by, for you locals, this is up by Sleeping Beauty Lookout. In fact, the 1929 picture was taken from the Sleeping Beauty Lookout, and I hooked it up there last summer and took the other picture to kind of kind of mimic it. Another species in the Middle Cascades is Western White Pine, Pinus monticola. This one is the first pine we've talked about, and of course, pines they have uh, their needles are in little sheaths called fascicles, and with Western White Pine. Each bundle has five needles. And if you look at that one in the middle there, uh, a couple of them are kind of bunched together, but if you look close, there's five needles in there. Uh, real distinctive for white pine is the large linear cones. They're usually found on the ground under the tree, or you can see them hanging from the branches. They're quite distinctive. And I tell you, every time I'm around a white pine, even if I'm not looking up, I usually spot it because there's a lot of cones on the ground. And the needles are very, very noticeable. So uh, Western white pine, five needles per bunch and, um, and those big long cones. It's got smooth silvery bark and young trees, hence the, that's where the name white pine probably came from. And it, it's more checkered bark on older trees. It's, it's distinctive once you get used to looking at it. White pine grows best in the open, but it can sus subsist in a shady understory for years. I have one I planted in my yard for my kids uh, at least 20 years ago, and it's in a shady area, and the thing is only still only about eight feet tall, but it's still doing well. So uh, 
but they can they can persist in the understory even though they 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 like it in the open they are kind of moderately shade tolerant uh, it can grow fairly large too on good sites uh, it's very tolerant of particularly frost and what i mean by that is uh usually growing season frost when, when trees are young and they they break their bud uh small trees if they if they're growing in a frost pocket in a a, a, a low area uh, sometimes an early growing season frost can kill the new growth and that can happen with douglas fir in uh and other species in in, in areas uh where uh where you get a frost pocket white pine and uh, one we'll talk about later lodgepole pine they're they're much more tolerant of it so it's a it, it can be a tough little devil White pine was decimated in the last century, though, by an introduced fungus called the white pine blisterus, which many of you uh, may have heard of. Uh, came in from Europe and uh, took out just most of our most of our western white pine. Uh, the resist resistant genotypes have been identified, and they're used in reforestation today. So it's it's uh, definitely on the on the rebound. Interestingly, back in the depression. Um, they tried to uh, control a fungus uh, with uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps and other groups. The, this, the, uh, the fungus has an interesting life cycle that spends part of its life on a white pine and part of its life on ribes or gooseberry plants. And uh, it, it needs both in order to complete its life cycle. So the thought was, well, you know, if we get people out in the woods and if we can pull up all the ribes, uh, maybe we can truncate this, uh, uh, break the life cycle and, uh, and cut back on the disease. So, uh, well, that, that didn't work. Uh, I guess it probably put some people to work, but uh, uh, that didn't work. But with genetics, uh, it's, it's, it's on the rebound today. Also, th there probably are just plain trees that are uh, somewhat resistant to it. I, years ago, I visited a stand in Idaho that was about 70 years old, and they were working with it. They were just taken out a few trees as they died, but they found that they could still carry the, a pretty good stand to, uh, to a rotation age when they wanted to uh, harvest it uh, just, by, just by working with it. White pine has uh, valuable wood. It's got a smooth grain. It's excellent for wood carving. Just a really beautiful tree. Well, now we're getting up high. We're going to head up into the woods. Now we're uh, getting up to the high elevation forest up near Timberline. Mountain hemlock, subalpine fir, white bark pine, and Alaska yellow cedar. Well, mountain hemlock, remember this is just like western hemlock. It's got that same droopy tip, and you do get both the trees in the same in the same place at uh, at the lower elevations where this one occurs. So you do have to look a little bit. But mountain hemlock is quite noticeable because needles are on all sides of the twig. They're not. Remember western hemlock; they were in two rows. With this species, they come out on all sides. The cones are also larger. They're about twice the size of Western hemlock cones. Uh, so uh, it's uh, bark has got some thin ridges, uh, hard to exactly identify by the bark. Bark's a tough one. It's a shade tolerant tree, just like its, it's uh, partner Western hemlock. Mountain hemlock grows from oh, about 3,500 feet to the tree limit. Although I've seen it all the way down to 2,000 feet in understories. It seems to uh, just little understory trees. Uh, I've seen it down much lower, but it's basically a, a higher elevation tree. It tolerates deep snowpacks, and it can go be anything from a fairly large tree to almost a shrub at timberline. And at timberline, it can regenerate by layering, and uh, that's something that uh, some of the other trees at, at timberline do. But uh, a branch can actually get pushed down by the ground. And, and then it can actually put out some roots and start another, uh, start another tree that way. And it's probably something that if those severe uh, conditions, it's, it's, it's something that's adapted so uh, it, can, it can regenerate in those situations more easily. Uh, uh, that the, the layered tree can, it's got protection from the uh, tree above it and uh, uh, it's not all by itself. So it's uh, kind of an interesting uh, adaptation. Another one we have up there, here's another one of those species, Abies, the third one we've had, Abies lasiocarpus subalpine fir. This is our highest elevation true fir, mostly again above 3,500 feet. Uh, upswept needles, uh, has they have one row of stomata on the upper surface, two rows on the lower surface. So now we've got one on the upper, two on the lower. I'm going to go over those later, the uh, different uh, uh, 
stomata pattern on the on the leaves of the true firs. It's got a usually a narrow crown adapted to shedding snow. And one thing that's really distinctive to me, it has almost a citrus smell. It's got kind of a, it smells like an orange uh, to me. Very distinctive uh, smell for subalpine fir. It's not long lived, rarely over 250 years, which is not real long for some trees. And, and near timberline, it grows in clusters. And again, it may also reproduce by layering up there. Uh, it is it is susceptible to fire because it has thin bark, and of course, it's uh, and its roots are fairly near the surface. And one thing I find is it's it's one that grows on uh, on the lava beds. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, lava beds on the on Mount Adams or the big lava bed down uh, uh, near Carson. Uh, uh, this is a species that grows on those. It, it's uh, it likes those those very cold situations. One that we have way up on the mountain, uh, both Mount Hood and Mount Adams and Rainier, I'm sure, and in, in the North Cascades is white bark pine. Uh, it's a tree of timberline. It, it can form a tree up to 50 or so feet tall, or it can be a shrub, just like the those other timberline species. It's a five needle pine like Western white pine. So every sheath has five little needles. And the cones are quite valuable for wildlife. Squirrels, uh, Clark's nutcrackers, uh, they, this, the nuts have a high fat content. And I, I don't know a lot about it, but I, knew, I know they're valuable for grizzly bears in, in the Rocky Mountains. I think when the bears come out of hibernation, one of the things they search out is if they can find any of these uh, cones from white bark pine, they, uh, uh, they love them. Uh, this species, like its cousin, uh, western white pine, is uh, susceptible to that white pine blister rust. And it's uh, because of that rust and, uh, and bark beetles and just climate change and fires, it's, this species is a candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act right now. So there's a lot of concern about the future of, what, of uh, white bark pine. Something that's kind of interesting that has happened, though, just like with uh, Western uh, white pine, uh, they've they've identified some genotypes that are uh, resistant to the uh, to the rust, and uh, they've collected seed from throughout its range, uh, and they take it to a lab, uh, uh, a genetics lab down in probably Dorena, Oregon. Plant them and then in, in, in give them a lot of rust and see which ones uh, come out of it or can can tolerate it, and they have found some uh, uh, genotypes that are appear to be pretty resistant. Uh, interesting, according to a friend of mine who's uh, just retired from the Forest Service, a number of those are from Mount Adams, and they've even gone as far as uh, planting some trees back on Mount Adams. So there's some what. Uh, uh, white bark pine has been planted in some of the burns, as, as most many of you probably know, there was, have been some big fires in the last 10 or 12 years on, on Mount Adams. Well, some uh, white pine, <clears throat> excuse me, some uh, white bark pine has been planted back up there. So we will see how that goes. But that, that's encouraging for a tree that we, you know, we worry about. Okay, our last one, big one, is in this one... Uh, you don't get a lot, a lot of down here, but some of you folks may be up near uh, Seattle, up near the North Cascades may be a little more familiar with that is Alaska cedar. Now, it's, it's uh, botanically a little bit different than uh, Western red cedar, but it looks like it. It's got scales, uh, 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 the same kind of uh, needles that uh, uh, Western red cedar has. But it always appears to me they, they kind of droop and it looks to me like a Western red cedar that's wilted. That's what I would say. But the, the thing that's really distinctive about Alaska cedar is it smells like raw potatoes. It's got a very distinct aroma. And uh, if you ever see one and you're not sure, if you just scratch a, a little bit of a, a twig and, and smell it, uh, believe you me, if it's this one, it'll smell like raw potatoes. It's, it, it's very interesting. Grows at high elevations in our area cold, wet, northerly slopes. I remember it. I used to work about by Packwood. We had it on the north facing slopes there. I'm a little further south here in uh, Trout Lake. We don't have very much. We do have some around Grand Meadows, which is an area north of Trout Lake, about halfway between here and the Cowlitz Valley, uh, and uh, growing right along the road. But uh, interesting species, very uh, 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 I don't know. I, th I think the wood is fairly valuable too. I don't know a lot about that, but uh, 
an interesting, not real common species in our area. Okay, now we've, we've climbed over the crest of the Cascades and we're kind of dropping down the east side and yeah, it's still kind of wet up here. So we still have silver fir and uh, mountain hemlock and western white pine. But we're going to pick up a few others. We're going to pick up western larch, uh, Engelmann spruce and lodgepole pine down here. Western larch, one of my favorite trees, our one deciduous conifer. Since we're called the evergreen state, I guess this one couldn't be our state tree because it's not evergreen. Uh, the needles grow in little clusters that grow on spur shoots. So even when the uh, stem doesn't have the needles on you, you can find these little spur shoots. And they're very, very noticeable in my mind. They're very soft green in early summer, very bright green. They stick out. And of course, in the fall, when they turn yellow, then they really, they really show up as they, uh, uh, before, they, before they drop their needles. The little cones are light colored with little protruding bracts. And uh, they're very, very pretty. I think they're a very pretty cone. And you can often still find them on the branches of trees. They, they stay on there. Uh, the bark looks a little bit, reminds me of an older ponderosa vine bark. It's got kind of some orangish and yellowish to it on older trees. Uh, and the, the, this little species grows very fast as a young tree. It is shade intolerant. Very, this one is very shade intolerant. It does not like any uh, shade at all. It's, it's adapted to getting up and growing. Uh, it's, it does, it grows very fast in its juvenile growth and, uh, and can be a, a fairly large tree. Uh, it's susceptible to needle loss, but the trees can regrow, regrow needles. It's, uh, uh, there's a, a fungus we get once in a while when we have a moist spring called Maria larissus, and it will kill some of the lower uh, needles on these trees. And I remember many times when I was at the Forest Service when somebody would come in and ask me what's killing all the larch. And I'd say, don't worry, they, uh, they're just adapted to it. That's a, it's a Mary Lursus is a native thing and they, uh, they recover from it and they, uh, but they, they, they do lose their needles once in a while. It's got a very valuable wood. And of course it's a beautiful uh, tree in the fall. I hope you can, guys can see that picture of the west side of Mount Adams and you can see a lot of larch sprinkled out through. There's no clear cut there. And then beyond it, there's uh, uh, that, that picture doesn't do it justice and real beautiful, uh, uh, view of larch there. And as you can see from the range map, it occurs here in the Cascades, but it's also pretty, it's really occurs over in the Rocky Mountains. So really neat species. Well, here's a, huh, I wonder if any of you have been to Larch Mountain in Oregon. There's a trail to right where this picture was taken. This, I, I got off this, so got off Google Maps. I just popped this one in, but uh, do anybody see anything they recognize? Maybe you, maybe you see kind of a bluish green tree. Let's see if I can, there we go. Well, what you're seeing is noble fir. And uh, this is kind of a, a neat little bit of trivia, but when, uh, when they were first lumbering out here, they wanted to convince people that noble fir was a valuable tree and larch was considered valuable. So they called it Oregon larch. And the name stuck. So uh, even though larch doesn't grow in this area, which is west of the Cascades. And so there's a Larch Mountain in Oregon and a Larch Mountain in Washington, and there aren't any Larch on Larch Mountain. So, uh, so if, you, if you take a hike down there and uh, somebody asks you to uh, point out the Larch, you can, you can tell them a story. Engelmann spruce are the one spruce we cover here. Like other spruces, it's got stiff, stiff needles. When you grab it, you know it. Uh, they're pointed, they're four-sided. Usually you can pick, pick off a needle and roll it in your fingers. And they're attached to branches by little pegs. Uh, the, scale, the cones are real soft, papery scales. Very, very distinctive in my mind. Uh, and the bark is kind of purplish or reddish. And the, the scales will flake off. It's, it's got a, if you guys, some of you may be familiar with Sitka spruce too. It's got a very similar thing. Somebody once called it burnt potato chip bark which kind of describes it to me a little bit, but it's got, it flakes off in little, little chips. Uh, Engelmann spruce is a tree of wet areas. It likes swamps and stream sides. Uh, it likes cold areas and it can grow to pretty good size also. It's got a thin bark. It's not fire resistant at all. And something you often see it, at least in our area, is there's a little, it's, it's kind of like an aphid, a little coolie adelgid. Uh, it's a little insect that, uh, 
they burrow into the branches and uh, and they kill it. And uh, but that that dead area, it's kind of swells up and it looks casually it looks like cones to the casual observer. So uh, this picture just shows one, but sometimes you'll see trees covered with these. Uh, interestingly, that same little insect, uh, another part of its life cycle is on small Douglas fir. And if you've ever seen little Douglas fir out in the woods and they've got like little cottony stuff all over them, that could very well be the other, uh, other part of the life cycle of this little adelgid. So interesting little tree. Spruce grows in the Cascades here. And as you can see, it's more widespread up in British Columbia and into the Rocky Mountains. Lodgepole pine, here's our, uh, our next pine. Now, unlike western white pine and white bark pine, this one has two needles per bunch instead of five. So uh, uh, I always say that to be a forester, all you need to do is count to five because that's, that's as many needles as you should need to, need to count out. Uh, it's got two short needles per bunch. The cones are small and prickly. They're about the size of maybe a cue ball and a, a, a pool ball. Uh, it's not a large tree, maybe up to 100 feet tall, and it's not long-lived. Uh, 150 years is an old tree for a lodgepole pine. Very prolific seed producer. Uh, in, in some parts of its range, in the Rocky Mountains, it uh, the cones are what they're called serotonous. They stay closed until uh, a fire or something. Uh, opens them and then they print out, put out a tremendous amount of seed. So it's very adapted to coming in after fires. In our area, the crones are not serotonous, but it does. It, this is an, an this is a tree that comes in after fires and other disturbances and is is quite an invader. Oops, one too, slide too many. Its lodgepole pine is very shade intolerant and very frost tolerant, like I mentioned with western white pine. Tolerant of poor soil and high water tables. It's it's a pioneer. It can come in a lot of places. Uh, grows in frost pockets and in low areas where the cold, cold air settles. And like uh, subalpine fir, it, it grows on lava beds. We have a couple of big lava beds down here uh, between uh, where I am in Carson on the Gifford Pinchot National Forest and up on Mount Adams and around Mount St. Helens. It, it likes those old lava beds. It, it's a tough little tree. There's an, uh, kind of a, a race of it that grows on the coast too. We call it shore pine, but it's the same species. This pine is contorta. So when you're over on the coast, if um, you're out on the dunes and you see these little uh, pine trees, pull off the needles and you'll see that there's two per fascicle. Lodgepole pine. Now we're getting into the low elevation forest. We're coming down out of the Cascades. Uh, under the warmer, drier side of the forest and getting into, this is where, kind of where I live and any of you that are in the white salmon area or uh, uh, even over in Hood River, this is kind of the ecosystem where we live in, these lower elevation uh, forests. And we'll talk about grand fir and ponderosa pine. Well, ponderosa pine, of course, is a very common tree on the uh, east side of the Cascades. It's like Douglas fir, I think most people know what it looks like. Got long bottle brush needles. By bottle brush, I mean the uh, the head with the needles on it looks like a looks like a bottle brush. And there's three needles per fascicle. So once again, you can if you count three, you know you've got ponderosa pine. The cones are three to five inches in diameter. You know they're the size of a softball, maybe uh, very woody, very uh, very beautiful cones. In fact, many of you, if you have uh, Christmas wreaths, that's quite often the, the cones you have in a Christmas wreath or ponderosa pine cones. The bark on older trees is uh, gets orange, as probably many of you have seen. Um, and uh, and I think of it as puzzle pieces. Quite often on those older trees, if you find some of that bark on the ground, it looks like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Ponderosa pine can grow very large and very long-lived. Uh, it, it's very fire resistant. It has a thick bark and it lacks shallow roots. I think many of you know that, uh, uh, like in the lower picture, uh, some of these open pine forests used to be maintained by fire. And it's it's not only the thick bark around them, but it's also the fact that it doesn't have a lot of shallow surface roots that it can withstand those light fires. Uh, the tree that I got my hand on, a little story about that. When I came here uh, in Trout Lake working with the Forest Service in 1980, about 41 years ago, and we looked at that tree. There was a timber cell right next to it, and they had wrapped a cable around it and partly crushed the bark. And so we got into a, a big discussion of where that tree was going to live. And of course, uh, 
a number of us who knew enough about ponderous spine said that tree will be okay. Uh, that tree's still alive. That picture there I was taken about four years ago, but it's still doing well. It's bigger than it was four years ago. And uh, it'll outlive me, I'm sure. But uh, very tough species, uh, very beautiful species. And uh, uh, we've, the uh, forest, the, in that picture, when you look behind me there, uh, the lower picture, of course, you see a very open forest without a lot of other trees. Well, with fire exclusion, if you look behind me in, in, in the upper picture, you can see what fire exclusion has done. We have a lot of grand fir and uh, Douglas fir in forests that are much thicker. So we've, we've changed the nature of those quite a bit. And also back in the 40s and 50s, a lot of those big pines were cut. So we've changed the nature of those forests quite a bit, but we still have a fair number of these uh, big, beautiful, old growth ponderosa pines uh, and uh, very nice species. Grand fir, now this is the last, the fourth and last of the genus Abies that I was gonna talk about. Grand fir, <clears throat> this needles are two rank. They're, they're uh, on two rows. And I often think it looks like somebody took an iron and just ran it across and flattened them out. And again, they're dull green on the top edge and they have two rows of stomata on the bottom. Uh, they're full crown, they're shade tolerant and, and the full crown of this species often carries all the way to the ground. And uh, you see that quite often. And it's, it's got kind of a grayish bark uh, with ridges and eh, not real descript, not hard to describe it by that. Uh, it's shade tolerant, it's a common understory tree east of the Cascades at lower elevations. So, it kind of fills a niche on the west side. We had Douglas fir and you have Western hemlock coming in under it. Over here, ponderosa pine and grand fir coming in underneath it. But it also grows, grand fir grows west of the Cascades also, not at least down here, not as common. But I know up near uh, Packwood, I remember seeing stands of very large grand fir growing right along the Cowlitz River. So it does grow on the west side, but uh, very common on the east side. It can grow fast and large. It can uh, be up to 150 feet tall. It does not grow particularly old, but uh, a very nice tree. It's susceptible to fire. Like I like I mentioned, this, this is a tree that probably there's more of because of fire exclusion than there used to be. But you know, I sometimes people talk about it like we, we don't want it, but it's everything's got value. And uh, one thing I always note, and you can see the in the snowy picture uh, on the upper right, um, it's, it's got great cover for wildlife in the winter. Uh, those little wells underneath the tree with the branches that come down can kind of shelter birds and, and small mammals, even deer I've seen in, in these things. So it's got kind of a, a, a neat little uh, habit, uh, that, uh, habitat that we don't think of and, and go out there in winter and look at it. Uh, it's benefited from fire exclusion, of course, because uh, we've allowed more of it to grow in and it's a larger component of our stands grows in the Rocky Mountains as well as in here on the uh, uh, West Coast. Grand fir, Abies grandis. The last species I'm going to talk about is Pacific yew. Uh, now this one isn't gross on both sides of the Cascades and it's, it's kind of a special one I wanted to talk about. It's got uh, Pacific yew has uh, two ranks uh, pointed needles. You see they're in two rows. And the picture doesn't really show it real well, but there's a little tiny point at the end of every needle. That's pretty pretty distinctive. Uh, the seed is an arrow, a fleshy fruit, uh, fruit uh, and it's an understory tree. It grows on both sides of the cascade and, and requires shade. Not very fire uh, resistant, kind of a scraggly bark. It's uh, uh, and it has a scattered uh, distribution. Interestingly of it though, some of you may know this story, but back in the uh, I guess it would have been in the 90s, we discovered that Taxol, a, a, a chemical you get from this, is important for the treatment of breast cancer. And at that time, all of a sudden, this little species, which we didn't pay a lot of attention to, frankly, was very valuable. To the point where the Forest Service was working on an environmental impact statement to determine uh, you know, how much of this could we safely remove or strip some of the bark off without endangering the species. Well, luckily it didn't take too long and Taxol was, they did, figured out how to synthesize it. And that took the pressure off of uh, removing uh, uh, Pacific U. But I'll tell you in the interim, we went out and we were looking for it. And uh, we had a lot more U than I realized just because we had never really looked at it, looked for it. 
but it's an example to me how everything everything may have something of value and, uh, and not to overlook anything. And like Aldo Leopold said, uh, Father Wildlife Management, he said something along the lines of the first rule intel rule the first rule of intelligent tinkering is don't throw away any of the parts. And so this is a good example of that an important little part. I'm going to review now a little bit before I give you guys a test. Not really, but um, because I kind of bounced around going because we were going from one part of the uh, forest to another uh, in elevation and the like. I'm going to go back over these true furs together. Once again, grand fur, the needles are two rank, pretty much in two rows, dull green on the top, two rows of stomata on the bottom. Pacific silver fur also dull green on the top and two rows of stomata on the bottom. But the difference is with Pacific silver fir, the needles grow on the top of the stem as well as uh, uh, on each side. And it's in mid elevations in the Cascades. Uh, noble fir, noble fir has needles that grow out on sides and the top of the stem and has two rows of stomata on each side of the needle. And again, mid elevation, mid elevation of the Cascades, real bluish tint. And subalpine fir, the needles grow the tops and sides of the stem again. One row of stomates on the top and two rows on the bottom. And this one has that very wonderful citrus smell. The pines, western white pine, five needles per fascicle. Those large long cones, both sides of the cascades. White bark pine, again, five needles per fascicle. You're not going to find those unless you're up near timberline. Ponderosa pine, Three needles per fascicle, uh, the dry forest seats of the Cascades, and our little lodgepole pine, two needles per fascicle, low and high elevations east of the Cascades, and on those cold lava beds and other sites. And Douglas fir and the true fir, once again, re the, the buds, sometimes people end up looking at both of these things at once, Douglas fir and true firs. Douglas fir can be identified by that little pointed bud, and true firs have blunt buds. So. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of a review of what I was uh, wanted to talk to you about. Okay, I want just a little cheerleading, just uh, finishing up, just a little cheerleading about trees. I uh, they they do many things for us. Uh, think of the products we use. Say, uh, you know, the wood is a wonderful structural element for uh, con for things. It's and it's it's one we get. You know, we use uh, a tree uses water and air and produces a and sunlight and produces a a structure we can use, pretty cool. It's important in watershed production, protection, not only in the amount of water we get out, but keeping our water clean. Forests are wonderful for that. Wonderful fish and wildlife habitat. Wildlife uh, and plants, uh, uh, epiphytes grow in trees. Uh, wildlife use it for perching, uh, in, uh, eating insects in, underneath the bark, uh, nesting in the tree, nesting in dead trees where there are cavities, Eating uh, uh, in, uh, insects that grow in, in the dead trees, it's a uh, wonderful wildlife habitat. And even fish, when these things fall in the stream, uh, they, uh, they provide uh, fish habitat, pools, and uh, just wonderful stuff. And think of carbon sequestrations, something we talk about a lot now. Uh, the, wood, uh, the wood in all those trees, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's a combination of carbon dioxide and uh, from the air and water and the, and the carbon of that carbon dioxide is sequestered in those trees as long as they're there. And even in the products, if we uh, make, a, uh, make a house or some kind of product where we don't, uh, that carbon doesn't deteriorate right away, it, it's, it's sequestered. Shade is another important one. This, this picture you see there, that's, that's my house. And that's a big, beautiful ponderosa pine I've got on the south side of the house. And I'll tell you that it's a little bit on the southeast side. That tree is equivalent of an air conditioner from us and an air conditioner that doesn't cost any electricity. Uh, and uh, I always tell people too, uh, on a hot day, have you ever been into uh, maybe Portland or Seattle and you go to a, a mall and you want to park and go in and some of those uh, parking lots have little uh, little alcoves with trees and what do you do? Everybody tries and runs and finds a place to park underneath a tree in the shade, right? So very valuable that way. And even uh, and, and, uh, all the, another energy saving is, is heat. Uh, I live in a forested area and I know uh, the valley I live in where people live out away from the uh, trees, then they, uh, 
they, they use more heat. They, uh, they block the wind, uh, uh, really valuable. And of course, aesthetics, like, uh, I, again, I look at that tree. I love it. It's, it's, it's a beautiful tree. Uh, we always, we all like the looks of trees. There have been studies done of urban districts, uh, urban, uh, commercial districts and districts with, with trees in them are preferred to those without and not too hard to, not too hard to see why they, uh, we do, we just like them. And finally, it's, these are all kind of measurable, but they also provide us something that's hard to measure. And that's something that's just inside of us. But, uh, you know, why do we call trees cathedral? Uh, uh, you, you, some of you probably heard of the term called forest bathing. Well, that's apparently a, a thing I believe in Japan and here in the U.S. now, but it's, it basically boils down to they, they do something, something to us spiritually. And nothing like being out in a, in a walk in a, in a, in a beautiful forest. Uh, just, uh, I don't know how to put it, put it better in words than that, but, uh, uh, they're, they're tremendous plants. Uh, and, uh, I'm, that's why I'm glad I'm a forester. Okay. I've given you an awful lot and I hope you weren't taking notes trying to feverishly put these down, but, uh, a couple of good references if you're interested specifically in trees. And I'll bet a lot of you know about this. This is a great book. Uh, in fact, I use some of the stuff I picked up for here. I got out of this It's called Northwest trees by an he's a forest ecologist named Stephen Arno and pen and ink drawings by Ramona Hammerley. And, uh, the, the one on the left is a picture of the copy I've got. Uh, the one on the right is uh, a more recent uh, edit that they put up. And I'll tell you, this uh, Ramona Hammer, the, the, uh, the pen and ink drawings she does of these species are like works of art, and they're incredibly accurate. And I think a lot of you, if you've used Hitchcock and the like, you all know how valuable pen and ink drawings can be. But uh, I'd buy this book just for the, uh, just for the drawings. But uh, Arno also has a, a chapter on each tree, a short chapter with some interesting facts, uh, a little key for description. This is just a really, uh, really good book. And there are many others you can get that are guidebooks for trees. The one on the right is one you can pick up from Washington State Extension for, I think, $5, Trees of Washington. It's got a key in it. And uh, for all of you in Oregon, uh, I don't have a new one, but I picked this up at a rummage sale years ago. This is from the 1960s, a little one trees to know in Oregon. Uh, there are many others. So uh, uh, the best thing to do is get a guidebook because there are many species out there, especially when you get up in the, get up in the woods when you're up hiking in the summer and the like. Uh, uh, there's a rich variety of species out there, pretty neat to, uh, to look at. And with that, that's about the end of it. There I am with one of my favorite spots in the forest, which has some very large Douglas fir and Western hemlock, my, uh, one of my favorite little stands. And uh, I'm sure that tree is probably five or 600 years old. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. And I, I want to put on there too, I've got uh, my email. So feel free to give me a shout if, you, if you've got a question or, uh, or a comment. Maybe some of you know more about some of this stuff than I do. but. Uh, at any rate, uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll open it up. Maybe maybe uh, Don's come up with some questions that I can can try to answer. I don't hear you, Don. You maybe. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here. I see a whole bunch of stuff in chat. John, I don't hear you. You may be, have you got yourself muted? There we go. There we are. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we're going to get right into our questions. Uh, if you need to leave, we understand, but we don't want to cut anybody off, so we'll stay for a little while. Also, again, the webinar will be available for viewing later tomorrow. Uh, it'll take Denise some time to get that up. So with that, let's go away. I'm going to start with the question and answers uh, box first. For Ron Klump, does Western Larch grow in any places west of the Cascade Crest? Uh, I think it. I think it does. I've seen a little bit down by the Wind River Nursery, but I think that may have may have come in as in uh, uh, 
may have come in from uh, nursery trees. Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I can't think of seeing a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if there, there is some. Uh, there's also alpine larch up in the North Cascades. There's another species of larch, which uh, I didn't cover, but uh, I, there's, there's not very much. I'm sure if you planted it, it would grow. You could probably get it to grow, but uh, uh, I, I don't know of any large amount of, at all of uh, larch west of the Cascades. Okay, and from Rudy Butterworth, we bought some acreage at Goldendale, and there are a couple ponderosa's pines that are dead should we take them out well take let's say yeah that's uh it's really up to you if they're dead if they're already dead they're not going to uh infect other trees so to speak uh trees that are uh looking poorly may have a bark beetle that can spread to other trees but once they're dead uh you know it's up to you uh if if they're in a safe place uh you could always leave them for uh for birds uh, I had a ponderosa pine die about 10 years ago in my backyard, about 200 feet behind the house, broke off, and I, I just left it, and uh, by gosh, the next year I had two pileated woodpeckers working on it, uh, and then it eventually fell over, and I, uh, I, I actually cleaned up part of that log, but uh, it's up to you. If it's in a, if it's in a place where it's, it's hazardous or falling on a fence or your home or something, of course, take it down, uh, and uh, and you know, if it's, uh, it's in the Golden Dale area, you have a lot of uh, high fire danger. Uh, if there's a lot of d debris around it and everything, at least clean it up. But uh, I, you could you could take them down or you could leave them. It's not a, usually ponderous pine is not considered a very valuable firewood. And if it's dead, probably the wood is decayed uh, uh, to make it of not much value. Uh, my, my guess is uh, your choice. Okay, from Anonymous, does Doug fur get l laminated root rot on yes, the east side of the Cascades? Oh yeah, you bet. Uh, Douglas fur gets laminated root disease. Uh, what that is for the rest of you, laminated root disease is it's a fungus, a, a native fungus, uh, will grow on the roots of Douglas fir and it, it can kill the tree. Uh, and it usually, it usually occurs in little pockets, uh, uh, and it'll kill a few trees and, uh, uh, and it costs some open, it costs some diversity in the forest. Uh, if, if, uh, uh, and yes, it does occur on both sides of the cascades. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a kind of thing that, uh, if, if, if someone has a, like a, a private landowner with commercial forestry trees, they'll want to get rid of it because it, it, lacks growth, but uh, sometimes you can, if you can cut the trees out and plant other species like ponderosa pine would be immune from the uh, laminate root disease, then you can grow trees on it. Other people might say, you know, it's uh, it, it makes a little opening with some snags and some shrubs and the like, uh, uh, you know, it adds some diversity. So it depends on what, you, what your objectives are that you're doing with your land. But yes, it does grow on both sides of the Cascades. And two uh, questions from Ed Connell. What are the purple star-like structures on the Ponderosa pine? Wow. I, I, I don't know. That uh, purple star-like structures. Not the pollen cones. I don't know what he's re I, I don't know what you're referring to, I guess. Uh, uh, doesn't doesn't ring a bell. Purple star-like structures. And his second second question is: Are there incense cedar north of Mount Hood? Uh, I, you know, uh, incense cedar grows in Oregon, and uh, I think the northern limits are somewhere around Mount Hood. I I've not seen it down there. I used to work on the Fremont National Forest way down in South Central Oregon, and we had just very little of it there too, except way down by the California border. But I'm pretty sure incense cedar does grow on the east side of the, on the east side of Mount Hood. So I think that's about the northern limit of, of its range. It doesn't, it doesn't move into Washington. So I think it does occur uh, down in the Mount Hood area. Okay, next question is from Lisa Apple. Is the Taxus brevifolia only in old growth forests. Oh, I have question. seen them only 
in the Salmon Huckleberry Wilderness area. That's down on the Mount Hood, I think, right? No, at least I've seen it uh, as I drive up Highway 141 from uh, White Salmon to Trout Lake. There's a couple right along the uh, right along the highway, and uh, I've seen it in in some younger forests. I think though it may do its best in older forests and some of the ones I've seen, maybe some of the trees have been cut and it was just left. But uh, I've seen it in, uh, I've seen it in somewhat open areas. I think in a, like in a, in a clear cut, it doesn't do real well uh, once, once it gets really opened up, but I'm not sure it might, maybe it just hangs in there and 20 years later, it's still there. You know, trees can be very tough, but I think, I think it's primarily something you see in a, Maybe not old growth, but at least bigger forests, forests with full stocking of trees and lots of shade. Okay, from Terry Sanders, what soil conditions do grand firs prefer? Oh, grand fir will grow in, uh, I think the main thing is uh, in a lot of uh, the range I, I know of where we are, it's, it's got to have uh, a fairly deep soil. If it's very shallow soil, <clears throat> you'll just get ponderosa pine. Ponderosa pine does pretty well on dry sites or further east of here, Oregon white oak. So I think grand fir probably needs a pretty good soil because it, it needs more moisture. It needs more moisture than, uh, than Douglas fir or ponderosa pine. And usually you're going to get more effective moisture if you've got a deeper soil. So that's about the best I can say on that one. Uh, but uh, you're not, you don't get as much of it anyway where this the shallow the soil is real shallow. And, and a related question to that is Grand Fur seems to grow in different environments. Can you talk about the different environments and elevations it grows in in the different parts of the state? Wow, I, 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 I can. I'm more familiar with down here. It's the common understory tree uh, uh, in our area. Uh, uh, south of Mount Adams on the east side of the Cascades, very common. And like I said, it's, it grows also on the west side of the Cascades at low elevations. And I think it may be, I'm just not that familiar with like the North Cascades and, uh, and some of that. I, I worked on the Olympic Peninsula and I don't remember seeing a lot of it, but a little bit, but it grows. And I think again, it needs, uh, needs pretty nice soils. I remember really nice grand fur growing along the Cowlitz River, but right along the river in some uh, some of those uh, 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 plateaus right along the river, which is really good growing sites. Uh, uh, and yeah, it grows, it grows, uh, it's a tough tree. It grows on the east side over here. But like I say, when it gets real dry, then you usually, uh, it, it starts to drop out of the picture. And from Linda Ziegenfuss, sorry if I mispronounced that, Linda. Uh, another Grand for a question. How come in the uh, Gifford Pinchot in the Wind River area, we see a lot of small grand fur, but I never seem to see any full grown trees? Well, hi, Linda. This, I, I know this is, you, you're, I think I met you. Larry, Larry's your husband, I think. And uh, uh, Larry runs, is with the, uh, one of the uh, fish hatcheries over there. Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not sure about that. Linda, I, uh, I haven't worked over there a lot in that valley. Uh, and I don't remember seeing a lot of large size uh, grand fur. It may just be that it's still coming in. Uh, you know, some of that stuff in the Wind River Valley is not all that old. It was logged maybe 50, 60 years ago. And maybe some of those trees are just starting to get in. And some of that valley I know has, uh, even though it's wet over there, especially down along the river bottom, it's, it's well drained. You have gravelly soils and sometimes, uh, Grandfur has a hard time get taken off real fast in that. But uh, any of you guys, if I'm not answering your question, shoot me an email. Maybe I, we can get into it a little further. But uh, I'm not. I'm just not familiar with seeing a lot of it over there, Linda. But uh, I'm not as familiar with that area as you are. And from our esteemed, hardworking president Sukush, the clear cuts near my home are replanted with primarily dug fir, and then an occasional ponderosa pine or a line of pines. Why both species when the dug fir is preferred? Yeah, well, you know what, once again, I always tell people your, uh, what you do with a forest depends on your objective. And of course, a timber company, their, their objective is to make, make 
make money out of those trees and grow trees that are valuable. So you see a lot of Douglas fir. But I think uh, you, you also see ponderosa pine. And up in our area, you see a lot of western larch, too, and ponderosa pine. And it's like not putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you know, if you can if you can mix in a couple of species, then you lessen the chance if, if you if you have uh, uh, an insect problem or something like that, you may it may increase the chance you're going to you're going to have some uh, fully stock stand still come through. So it's it's not putting all your eggs in one basket. And it's just uh, with the forest we always planted more than one species uh, in a clear cut be, just for, for variety. Uh, so uh, I think that's probably what they're doing there. Uh, that's a good practice, I think. Does the white pine blister rust also cause detrimental effects on ribes? That's a, I don't think so. I think it, uh, you know, of course, you know, it, it's funny how that works. It may maybe kill some of the plants, but we don't pay much attention to that. We pay attention to trees because that's something we, uh, if if you're managing for timber at all, you want that you want a good product. But uh, I don't. I think it just. I don't think so. I think it just grows on the uh, on the leaves. I'd have to look that up actually. But uh, uh, probably the biggest damage we did to ribes was back in the 30s trying to pull it all out. But, uh, so would you rather have gooseberry pie or your log cabin? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. There are some trees here in Bellingham that look like redwoods. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, down in our area. Uh, it's not redwood, but giant sequoias have been uh, uh, planted. Giant sequoia, you know, there's redwoods are the, the tree that grows along the coast in California in the fog belt. They need to be where there's a lot of moisture. And giant sequoia are the ones that grow up in the, in the, in the mountains, Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon National Park. Two different species. Down here, we see uh, in Carson, Washington, and even in White Salmon, even a, little, even a little bit up here in Trout Lake, people have planted giant sequoias, and they grow. They grow fine. They can they can get to be a very big tree. Up there in Bellingham, you know, you, you may have redwood. You may have California redwood because you're down in the in, along the coast, and it's probably pretty wet and moist. So, I'm not sure. A lot of times, people don't know the difference or they don't casually don't know the difference and they call them all redwoods but uh it's either redwood or giant sequoia and uh uh you know take a take a good look at it and, and get a key book and, and figure it out but definitely they can they can both grow up there okay and uh pacific U up here in olympia area grows just fine after the other trees are harvested around it it's slow growing, so it's more noticeable in older trees. Good point. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, and I think, uh, like I said, I've seen it in in uh, kind of an open area, which may have be maybe it was harvested, but it it hangs in there, and uh, it's a it's a it's a tough little tree. So I'm gonna quickly switch over to chat here. We had a bunch of questions there. But apparently they didn't stick around. I can't pull them up. So I think that is, wait a minute, maybe here's one Ooh, here. here. Uh, from Sue at the Suxdorfia board. Thank you, Jim, for a great presentation. Well, you have Krista. so much. Yeah, thanks to Krista too. I know her well. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, here we go. Now I got my chat back. Glad to see you both. I think that pretty well covers most of the questions. There were some in the chats earlier, but apparently those didn't stay on long enough for me to get to the end of the session. Oh, they disappear when people leave. Maybe the I don't know. Yeah. Well, anyway, let, you know, if it's still recording, let's just say uh, at the end of that, you, uh, the last slide has my email. And uh, uh, oh, here we go. We got a we got a, a question here from Jacqueline Rose. Uh, Does ponderosa pine have a distinctive smell? That's a good question, Jacqueline. Uh, Jeffrey pine, which is kind of like ponderosa pine, grows in southern Oregon and I think in northern California. They talk about it having a uh, smells like vanilla. And a few people 
I've had a few people here talk about ponderosa pine sometimes smelling it. I've never, I've never noticed it, but uh, uh, the, the smell is something like van vanilla. You smell a bark, especially on older trees, uh, as I understand it, but it doesn't work for me. My understanding is that it's more of a thing with Jeffrey pine. I see a couple other things that came in here on the sure. Q&A. Okay, redwoods do grow in Shelton, Washington, according to somebody, I don't know who. And uh, Mariah Williams, can you talk a little bit about bristlecone pine? Have you noticed them being impacted by climate change? Well, we don't have bristlecone pine up here, so I, I, I really don't know much about it. Uh, that's, I believe that's just all down in California, but uh, uh, I, I don't really, I'd, I'd have to look it up. I don't, I don't know much, but I'm guessing it probably is uh, impacted by climate change, but uh, I, I really don't know. And from Terry Sm 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 Smollison, how will climate change affect native tree species? Boy, that's good a question. big one. That's a good question. And it's, you know, uh, of course, a lot of a lot of speculation. I think you'll see over time uh, species range changes. Uh, let me put it this way: uh, like I say, if you guys are if you're familiar with the gorge at all, like I said, you move from west to east, it gets drier. Uh, east of Goldendale, I did a forest plan uh, a few years ago. Two thousand two hundred acres, not one Douglas fir on the property. Only ponderosa pine. If you go west of there, as you go west, you pick up Douglas fir. You go further west, you pick up grand fir, and then you get into the Cascades with silver fir and everything. I like to think about it as, as it gets warmer and drier, uh, what's going to, what it's going to be like. I think, well, go look at the next area near you that's warmer and drier. And uh, for instance, in my area in Trout Lake, in some day, we have Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, and, and grand fir. And uh, it may be that someday grand fir will have a much tougher time growing and uh, just like east of here. And uh, I, I think you can, you can look at it along those lines. I, uh, it's uh, think of warmer, drier climates and, and, and think about warmer and drier areas near you or that you know of and think of what you got there compared to what you have now. Uh, some of it's a crapshoot, you know, and it's not gonna be gradual changes. This is my opinion is the things that are gonna happen is you get a big fire and then maybe some species just don't come back in or have a much harder time coming back in. So uh, it may occur in, in spurts and jumps rather than just a slow change. But that, that's speculation, you know, there's a lot we don't know yet about climate change. So I'm just looking here, okay. Um, I think we probably now have been going uh, about an hour and almost 25 minutes. So it's probably time to call it uh, uh, for everyone. Um, can you give your email once more, Jim, just so people can? Yeah, it's in it's in my last slide. And let me pull that can, up real quick. Yeah, let me pop that up real quick and. Uh, there it is right there, J-W-H-I-T-E period M-A-R-S at gmail.com. We'll leave that all up here for a minute so people can copy it. I wish that I could un my, uh, activate all your mics so we could give J Jim a great big, huge round of applause. You certainly gave us a lot of wonderful information, Jim. It's a very good presentation. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all of you for listening and for your great questions. And we look all look forward to a no COVID day when we can get together and go hiking again. Amen. And thank you all for attending. I wish I could hear, I wish I could have talked to everybody and listened to everybody, but uh, this is better than, uh, better than nothing. So this works. Thanks, Don, for uh, uh, riding herd over me and everything. And thanks to uh, Denise also for helping. Yes. Out. Thank you, Denise, for helping us out and helping us pull this off. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Wonderful program. Cheers, everyone. Okay. Good night, everyone. All right.